Many of you probably didn't know he lived here, but a lot of you will remember the huge scandal he was best known for. Clifford Irving died in Sarasota last month. Remember the name Clifford Irving? Remember the phony autobiography of Howard Hughes in the early 1970s? Ray Collins recently sat down with his widow for this fascinating look at one of the nation's most controversial authors. It may be hard to believe this little boy would grow up to be at the center of one of the most notorious literary hoaxes in history. Clifford Irving, born in 1930 and raised in Manhattan. He began at the New York Times, and by the time he was 40, he had written several novels. But it was what happened next that launched his life into infamy. Will you meet the you bring your cooperate with you on that book? I'm sorry, I've got no comment at this point. Irving hatched a scheme to pretend he wrote an autobiography about billionaire recluse Howard Hughes. Irving banked on Hughes, never wanting to come forward to stop the hoax. But Hughes eventually did, but not before Irving collected over half a million dollars that he promised to pass along to Hughes. Irving eventually confessed and served 17 months behind bars. That prison is a nice place to visit, but I don't want to live there. Do you owe anybody any money at this point? Yes, I owe uh, a total of about uh, just under $1 million to the IRS, to McGraw-Hill, and to my various attorneys. How do you think you're going to pay that off, or are you? Slowly. <laughs> I really wanted him to write a, me a memoir because his life apart from the hoax was so fascinating. This is Julie Irving. This sophisticated Australian met Cliff on a ski lift in Aspen back in the 1990s, and despite their 20-plus year age difference, she, according to Wikipedia, became his sixth and final wife. It was the stories. I just wanted to hear the stories. They moved into this ranch-style home along Philippi Creek four years ago, a home decorated by Cliff's paintings, including one of Julie in the pool, that doesn't skip many details. You want me to move all this? We sat down at the same table where Cliff very recently spent much of his final years reading, writing, and thinking. I began by asking Julie about the hoax that later defined his life. Had you heard of him or about him when you first met him? I think I had. I was about 18 when, when, when the hoax broke. I was in Australia. I, um, I have a vague recollection, but didn't know the whole story. So when I met Cliff and he started to tell me about the hoax, I was fascinated. And uh, because he just had one story after another. Some people would have found the hoax as being a turnoff. How did you find it? I was fascinated that, it, that, he had the, that he had the audacity to do it. You didn't see it as a sign of dishonesty. Oh, in a way I did. Yes, yes. I did see it. Absolutely I did. Um, I don't I think, I think, in a way I'm glad he, he went to prison because I think it really made him realise that um, um, he couldn't get away with, with doing something like this. Do you think he had any regrets about it? I do. Did it come up a lot in your conversations over the years, or, or rarely? It did come up. I mean, we talked about it. It was, it was always a topic that, that people wanted to know, like friends of ours and um, people that, that, that met Cliff. That was what he was known for, so he, people wanted to hear. And he, he, he didn't feel comfortable talking about it, but then when he did, he would just slowly open up and, and reveal different details about about the episode, but he was bored with it. He says, he, as he said, this was a situation where I did this in in the 70s. Um, it's here. I'm here and now. This is that happened in the past. I just want to let it go. So I think he had regrets about that. That he that that it still haunted him, but he tried to use it to his advantage as well. In fact, he eventually sold the rights to the story. Richard Gere starred in a movie called The Hoax. I mean, I kind of imagine Clifford sitting around at a dinner party, and by all accounts, he was an incredibly charming guy, and saying, what if, what if you wrote a book, mixing drinks, what if you wrote a book, a story, about someone who could never refute it because he's too crazy to refute it? He doesn't talk to anybody. How long do you think you could get away with that? 
Texas rock. And I think that just started this process, and I think it just got out of hand. When he didn't like the movie, I didn't like the movie. Um, he was very distressed about it because they had been calling him and getting as much information as they could about the actual events, and then they rewrote a lot of it. Julie says her husband spent much of his time at home playing online chess with worldwide competitors, going out to lunch with a few friends, and belonging to a local club that even Julie admits is ironic. He joined the Liars Club. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> really? There's a Liars Club? A Liars Club. And it was a group of writers that met um, every few weeks. That's pretty ironic. The end came fast last month for the six foot three, 250 pound man with size 16 feet. Julie says she was in Australia when Cliff came down with what appeared to be a hiatal hernia, but later turned out to be a cancerous mass on the pancreas. He was in pain, didn't want to go to the hospital. Finally, he said, yes, I'll go to the hospital. And within a matter of, I think, three days, three or four days, he passed. But the funny story is the day before he passed, the doctor came in to see him and the doctor raised the bed to eye level with Cliff and Cliff said, doctor, I want to go. And the doctor said, he knew what, doc oh, he knew what Cliff was talking about. He said, Cliff, I can't help you with that. If I do, I'll go to jail. And Cliff said, I won't tell anyone, which was just, <laughs> that was just so classic Cliff. You know, and everybody, the doctor just roared with laughter at that. <laughs> Cliff's death at the age of 87 was written up all the way from the New York Times to the Aspen Times. Despite his very full life, it was the hoax that is still detailed in bold print next to his picture. Julie understands it, although she wishes people would realize. His life was so much more than, than the hoax. And as for Julie now, well, she's very matter of fact about his death. I still haven't processed it. He wanted to go. He was ready to go and I didn't want to see him in pain. And he'd lived a full life. He was 87. So he was ready to go. I, and I don't feel a sense of loss. We had such a full life together. In Sarasota, Ray Collins, ABC7, your Suncoast News. Coming up, did you know that Clifford Irving went on to contribute to Sarasota Magazine? That's next on The Trapezoid. Welcome back. We live in an age where it seems there is a new scandal just about every week. I don't know if scandals happen less frequently in the 1960s or 70s, but even as a kid, I remember the scandal involving Clifford Irving and the phony autobiography of Howard Hughes. We are all more than one big thing that we are known for, and Clifford Irving went on to be a prolific writer who eventually settled in Sarasota until his death last month. But he will always be known for that book and the frenzy that ensued. And joining us for more is Pam Daniel, the editorial director of Sarasota Magazine, where Clifford Irving went on to be a contributor of some incredible stories. And, and this is fascinating. And how you came to know him and ask him to write for you is also a fascinating story. Well, he just walked into our office one day in the 1990s. And I can still kind of see him, this tall, lanky, very engaging guy. He had a habit of carrying a straw purse from Mexico with all his papers and things in it. And he explained that he was working on a book. He wanted to do a legal thriller set in Florida. And he just basically just came in to connect with a local magazine because he figured we would know a lot about the town and we could connect him with some attorneys and judges. And he was just so charming that Bob Plunkett, one of our editors, and I became friends with him, went out to lunch with him, introduced him to the town. And during that period, of course, as you said, he was defined by the hoax. And that's the first thing you thought of when he walked in there. But you could see he didn't really like to talk about it that much. But it just came out one day at lunch that he had spent the summer before he went to jail, right here in Sarasota, just through a coincidence. Actually, it was his father's mistress, ex-mistress, lived here on Longboat Key. And he wrote to her. He had custody of his boys that summer because his wife went to jail first, so one parent could be with the boys, and she invited him to come down. So he spent this crazy, um, tranquil, but knowing what was ahead of him summer on Longboat Key. 
And we said, you have to write that story for us. So he doesn't like talking about what happened, but you convinced him to write a story about that summer before he went to prison. Remind us what he said about that, that period of time here in Sarasota. Well, he said it was very surreal. And, and because Florida, Sarasota was like this privileged, quiet enclave, and Murph Clobber was running the Colony Beach and Tennis Resort at the time, and he invited Cliff to come out there with his boys. So he would go take the kids out there in the day and go swimming. But he had a quiet, long time to think about what was ahead. His wife was writing to him from prison saying that she wanted a divorce that was hanging over him. And um, it, it just was such a contrast with what was ahead. And he, I remember he wrote that a year later when he was in prison, sometimes he could imagine that he could hear the shells on the beach and the water on Longboat Key. That kind of tranquil time would come back to him. It, it seems like he was an incredible charismatic man, obviously a prolific writer about many different things, but how do you jive that as uh, you know, someone who uh, runs a magazine and has dedicated your career and, and others at the magazine to writing about truth uh, or nonfiction fiction and this man who pulled off one of the, the, the biggest capers in literary history. Well, I wasn't, first of all, it's not that he would write for us very much. We right. were basically a small magazine and what we paid compared to what he would be getting for national articles he did. He kind of did it as a favor to us. But he was writing a memoir about his own experience. He wasn't reporting on other things. And it worked out so well because when he came here in the 90s, he was also trying to figure out the legal system in Florida. At that time, I don't know if it's still true, but you could be before a jury and a jury could sentence you to life and a judge could overrule that. And he was kind of outraged by that. So he came up with the idea, a judge could sentence you to death. He wanted to write a book about a man who'd been wrongly convicted. So he was exploring, he went from Sarasota to Rayford, where the prison is, then to Jacksonville. And then it turned out he got arrested and had a run-in with Florida law in Jacksonville. For what? Um, it was all really a mistake. He went into a radio shack. He was living in Mexico at the time. His wife had bought him, I forget, a recorder or something, and it didn't work. We only have less than a minute left, but I want to ask you this, that despite what happened, he was, he was able to carve out a very um, uh, you know, prolific career writing. How did that come to be? Well, you know, I think he was one of the last of a vanishing breed. He was a swashbuckling, larger-than-life writer, very devoted to his craft. But he lived all over the world in the most romantic places. He lived on a houseboat in Marrakesh. He made and lost a fortune. He had six wives. He won a monkey in a poker tournament once. So he just had this curiosity, this passion, and explored the world and hung out with the most amazing people. Pam, thank you so much for coming in tonight. Fascinating, You're fascinating welcome. stuff. Thanks a lot.